Okay, so last time I introduced the idea that information in a living system can be thought of as a kind of a blueprint that a cell could use to make more copies of itself, or actually more copies of the molecules that it's made of. And we're going to return to this theme of information in this lecture today, but we also need to take a little detour uh, in order to provide some important background uh, material that will help us later on in the course. Specifically, I want to begin today's lecture uh, by describing the hierarchical organization of life. And then second, after I've introduced you to this hierarchy, I want to draw your attention to two particular levels in this hierarchy, the cell on the one hand and the organism on the other, that are particularly useful for understanding how biological processes work. Now, our discussion of the organism, that'll be the first of these, will pick up directly on the point we left off with last time, that is the relationship between reproduction and evolution. Our discussion of the cell will provide some important general background for many of the processes and principles that we want to discuss throughout the course. Now, a fundamental characteristic of life, as we've already discussed, it is, that, is that it's very orderly. The orderliness of life is obvious if you look at any living thing, whether it's a bacterium, a tree, a bird, or yourselves. When you do look at a living thing, you immediately get an intuitive sense that life must involve a high degree of order. What becomes equally apparent as you start to look at living systems more closely is that this orderliness of life occurs in a hierarchy of structural levels. What do I mean by this? By hierarchy, I simply mean that living systems, are, um, living systems exhibit order across a range of different scales or sizes of things, starting at the smallest size of molecules that we've already talked about a little bit and going all the way up to the scale of the entire planet. The hierarchy of biology is sort of intuitive to understand, and so let's just describe it briefly. The molecular level this smallest, most reduced level, this is the level that's closest to physics and to chemistry. As we discussed in the first lecture, life depends on a particular kind of chemistry, organic chemistry involving carbon. Now, this patterning at this level, the organization, is the organization of different parts of a molecule relative to each other. But living systems have several molecules, many molecules, billions of molecules working together. And the next level of organization is the organization of these molecules relative to each other. Now, the most fundamental level that we talked about already briefly in the last lecture is the level of the cell, where a bunch of molecules come together in a highly organized fashion to form a, a, a package. Now, in some organisms, multicellular organisms, different kinds of cells come together in organized patterns themselves, forming what we might want to call tissues. Or, in fact, tissues might come together in large, complex organisms to form what we might want to call organ. We're all kind of intuitively familiar with what we mean by tissues and organs because we're made of this stuff. Tissues and organs come together into a special unit called the organism. Now, we all know what an organism is. I'm an organism. You're an organism. The butterfly is an organism. The bird is an organism. But there's levels above organisms. You might think that must be where this hierarchy ends, right? Because how am I connected to the bird or the butterfly? I mean, I've got this unit here. But in fact, as we'll see later in the course, organisms come together in groups of the same thing that we'll call populations and understanding certain processes of biology will involve us taking a look at how groups of organisms interact. And in fact, different kinds of organisms come together in what we might want to call a community of different species. And as we'll see, these communities have certain properties that come from the kinds of organisms that make them up. We can go even farther because communities of different organisms might be linked through geophysical processes across wide distances to form what we'd call an ecosystem. And in fact, at the largest scale, the entire planet Earth is a kind of ecosystem, something we call biosphere. We really all are linked together. Okay, so that's the hierarchy, and it's not too difficult to understand. And 
the important point I want to make now is that biological organization, this hierarchical organization, has a unique property that's not observed in other kinds of hierarchies, and that is that the properties at one level in the hierarchy are not completely predicted by the properties at the lower level. Let me make this clear by giving you an example of how a brain works. Right? We know a brain is a very complex organ. A human brain, for example, is what we're using right now to talk, to listen, to understand, to have emotions. The brain is an organ. Now, this organ is made up of a number of different cells, actually quite a few different cells of different kinds. Those cells are called neurons. We can study these neurons in detail. We can take them apart. We can understand their physical properties, their chemical properties, their electrical properties. And if we did that, we still wouldn't be able to predict, just based on what we knew about neurons, how brains work. Why not? Because the way a brain works is an emergent property that only appears when all of those cells are organized together in a particular fashion. So a characteristic of the hierarchical organization of biology is this property of emergence of new features, new properties, at each level as we go higher and higher in the organization. A consequence of this, and really the way that we're going to be moving through material in this course reflects this, is that to deeply understand something about how living systems work, we have to look at it across different levels of organization. We have to analyze it at low levels and high levels, just as to understand how a brain works, we would have to not only know how the cells that make up that brain work, but we'd have to know how that brain is fit in with other organisms or other organs to make the entire body. And even more than that, to really understand how brains work, we also have to look at how individuals vary in a population and possibly even at how different kinds of species interact because, in fact, that's a lot of what brains are about, interacting with other organisms in the environment. So life is inherently hierarchically organized this hierarchical organization is characterized by emergent properties as we go up the hierarchy. And to understand things in biology, we have to look across this range of, of levels. However, there are two levels of organization in biology that are particularly important for us to consider for very different reasons. One is, as I said, the level of the organism. And the other, as I said, is the level of the cell. So for the remainder of this lecture, I want to explain in turn why I think each of these levels of organization are particularly important to look at when we're trying to understand something in biology. Let's start with the organism. Here's the answer. The reason the organism is a particularly critical level in the hierarchy of living things to understand is that it is at this level of organization at which reproduction occurs, and therefore, as I'll explain in a minute, it's at this level of organization at which um, evolution, on which evolution most directly acts. Let me explain what I mean by that statement by going back to our discussion of the origin of life from the last lecture. Now let's imagine back one more time that here we are in the primitive earth, and we have some kind of protocell that has all sorts of lifelike properties. Let's even call it living. It can take in organic material, use catalytic agents such as enzymes or maybe primitive RNAs to process this organic material. It grows, it reproduces, and let's even give it now, as we talked about last time, a primitive genetic system, a way that it can take information about its own structure and pass it on to its offspring. The offspring of this protobiont, given this primitive genetic system, therefore, can be like the parent. It can take the properties of the parent and pass them on. We say that traits that can be passed on this way through some genetic mechanism are heritable. But it's unlikely, if you think about it, that all of the offspring of this protocell would be identical. And the reason is, is that any time you try to copy a blueprint or a code, there's always the chance that errors will creep in. Now, the idea of errors creeping in isn't very um, surprising. Even the highly derived DNA-based information system that we find in modern cells 
is very prone to copy error, as we'll see in a few lectures. And this is in spite of the fact that there's a huge amount of molecular machinery devoted to trying to find and correct those errors. Mistakes are made. An important consequence of this introduction of copy error is that it creates variation among the offspring of, say, this primitive cell. Not all of the offspring will necessarily be identical. So now we've introduced variation into a group of primitive cells. Knowing how this, or this error might creep in isn't important to us right now. We'll talk about this later when we talk about DNA. But an important consequence or important fact to keep in mind about it is that these errors are random. Thus, it's hard to predict what the nature of the variation in offspring will be. Okay, finally, now imagine that different versions of these protobionts among the offspring actually are not all equally good at doing whatever this primitive cell does. Remember last time I told you we might have something arise and it would make a primitive cell do something a little better. Well, now imagine we've got a bunch of cells, we've got a genetic system, they're producing offspring, variation is produced in those offspring, and that means that some of these variations, by random chance, will be able to do something a little bit better, and some of them might actually be a little bit worse at doing what they do. So, so far so good. Now this is when it gets interesting. At some point, the tide pool that these little primitive cells are living in is going to start filling up. They're reproducing. There's more and more cells. What are they doing? They're taking in the organic molecules from the primordial soup and processing. That's how they grow. But as there are more and more cells and fewer and fewer organic molecules for them to eat, so to speak, eventually there's going to be competition. Not all of these cells will get everything they want. If some of these cells are better at getting that stuff or processing it or doing whatever than others, what that means is that some of these cells will be able to reproduce themselves more and other cells will be able to reproduce themselves only less. This differential reproduction among the variations that we see in this group of cells means that over time, whatever information is possessed by those cells that are doing it better will become more prevalent in that group of cells, in that population of cells. Why? Because the versions of that cell that are doing it better will reproduce more. They're getting more of the stuff. They're growing faster. They're dividing more. Whereas the versions of those cells that are doing it less well will reproduce less. And so they will be less able to pass on their version of this information to subsequent generations. The process I just described in a very small nutshell, and we're going to come back to it in detail later, is basically evolution by natural selection. We have variation among organisms. We have competition among those organisms for some limited resource. As a result of that variation in competition, there's differential reproduction with some individuals reproducing more and some individuals reproducing less. And a consequence of that is over time, better versions of these cells, traits that are more advantageous, will become more prevalent in that population of cells. And we call those traits that become more prevalent, those traits that evolve through natural selection, adaptations. Now, it's these adaptations that in the early Earth must have somehow taken those protobionts and made them more and more complicated, more and more uh, diverse, until finally we get kangaroos and things like that. But from our point of view, the key thing to keep in mind is that as we look at biological uh, at, at biology now, as we look at biological processes now, how life works, pretty much everything we're interested in is in one sense or another some sort of adaptation. It all came from this protocell that could do virtually nothing to doing all the stuff that biology does now, and it's all the result of adaptation from natural selection. And this is why the organism is such an important level of organization to understand in biology. Even as life became increasingly complex and diverse, with these primitive cells leading to large, diverse things like kangaroos and us, the individual organism, whether it's a single cell or me, is still the unit that does the reproduction. And therefore, the organism is the level 
on which natural selection acts in the evolution of adaptations. And what that means is that if we want to understand adaptations, and another way to say that is if we want to understand pretty much anything that goes on in biology, then we need to see how that works in the context in which selection acted. We need to understand it in the context of organisms. So organismal biology is very important to us because ultimately that's where our questions in biology come from. Life does stuff. That life that's doing stuff are organisms on which selection has acted over a long period of time and we can understand biological processes by putting those questions into organisms. Okay, so now let's turn back to the level of the cell. Why do we still care about cells then if in fact a lot of organisms like ourselves have now become multicellular? What's the point of the cell? Why is that an important level? Well, there are two related answers to this question, really. The first answer is that the cell is the minimal unit of structure capable of independently performing all the activities of life. That is, the cell is the smallest unit that could be truly called living. Even in multicellular organisms like ourselves, we are still made up of individual single cells and most of the fundamental processes that make us work are working in the context of this unit of the single cell. In fact, in large complex organisms like ourselves, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of cells, each with its own unique structure and function, each with its important role to play. But each of those roles is played out in the context of this fundamental, most important package. So, the cell is important because it is the fundamental unit of organization that can function on its own. And so as we take apart even the most complex systems, we often find ourselves bringing it down to how a cell functions. Now the second reason that the cell is such an important level of organization, which is really related to the first, I mean it's, it's how the first works, has to do with this idea of packaging that I introduced earlier. By packaging, I simply mean the ability to separate this from that, to separate the inside from the outside, to separate one kind of molecule from other kinds of molecules, to separate one chemical reaction from other kinds of chemical reactions. The chemistry of life is very complex, and it's this complexity of chemistry that allows us to do all the diverse things we do, at least on that one fundamental level. And, and here's the point, it's the packaging provided by cells that allows this complex chemistry to occur because different processes can be kept separated. Let's look at cells a little bit. Now, there's a little bit of background about cells. They're actually, in living things, fundamentally two different kinds of cells. Everything that's alive is made of one kind of cell or another kind of cell, and I just want to give you some background about this. We call these two types of cells prokaryotes, or prokaryotic cells, and eukaryotes, or eukaryotic cells, respectively. Now, prokaryotic cells are the things that sort of we've been talking about when we've been giving these arguments about the evolution of life on, or the origin of life on Earth. Um, and like those protocells, prokaryotic cells are enclosed by a single membrane. This is sometimes called the cell membrane simply. It's sometimes called the plasma membrane. This plasma membrane or cell membrane is primarily composed of a particular kind of organic molecule, lipids. These are the fats that we've talked about before. And we're going to talk more about lipids and cell membranes later in the course when that becomes relevant. The only thing we need to know about this lipid cell membrane for now is that its chemical properties provide a uniquely effective barrier for separating things in an aqueous, in a watery environment. Because water doesn't pass through it very well. And so it's particularly good for keeping molecules inside and outside separated. So what are prokaryotic cells today? I mean, we've gone beyond the, the tide pools of the early Earth. Well, prokaryotic cells today are the things that we commonly refer to as bacteria. All prokaryotic cells are single-celled organisms. Sometimes they occur in large masses, large mats, for example, but even then, each prokaryotic cell is its own separate individual, single-celled individual that reproduces on its own. 
There are some other structures too. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to run prokaryotes down. I mean, I have to point out that if you look at a prokaryote in detail, you see some other kinds of structures in there. I mean, some prokaryotes will have very long tails on them called flagella uh, that allow them to move around. Some prokaryotes will have some infoldings. But by and large, prokaryotes represent a single package. Now, this doesn't mean that prokaryotes are somehow losers in any way. In fact. Prokaryotes, in spite of this structural simplicity, are actually some of the most um, successful organisms that have ever existed on the planet and that exist today. Prokaryotes occupy a wider range of environments. They span a broader range of biochemistries than any other group of organisms, and they're extremely abundant. Prokaryotes are everywhere. For example, the number of a particular kind of prokaryote called E. coli. Escherichia coli that lives in the guts of humans, for example, the number that live in a single human's gut exceeds the total number of humans that has ever lived on the planet. So it's not like prokaryotes should be ignored just because they're simple. Nonetheless, we're talking about packages, and this leads us to the other main kind of cell, the eukaryotic cell. These are structurally much, much more complex. Everything other than bacteria that lives. Including anything we might want to call a plant, an animal, a fungus, is composed of eukaryotic cells. Now there are a number of organisms, protists, that are single-celled eukaryotes. So it isn't that eukaryotic cells are necessarily multicellular; they can be single-celled. But all multicellular organisms, such as ourselves or birds or trees, all of those are、uh, composed of eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are primarily characterized by the fact that they are not only a package themselves, but they have inside them a very complex internal set of compartments or smaller subpackages within, each separated from the different parts of the cell by its own additional lipid membrane. Now. The internal packages or compartments of a eukaryotic cell are something that we could spend a lot of time listing. We could memorize those details. But what I want to do is to broad, broad, or draw this more broadly out to point out that there are really three main types of internal packages that we find in eukaryotic cells. Let me list those three main types for you, and then go through them in turn. There are some internal packages that are specifically Devoted to the problem of information storage and processing, one in particular that we'll talk about in a second. There are some of those internal packages that are specifically devoted to the problem of processing and storing energy. And then there's a third set of uh, of uh, internal structures that are devoted to the problem of transporting. And packaging biochemical products and reactions. That third set, by the way, I'll just tell you, is commonly called the endomembrane system, and we're going to talk about that last. Well, let's talk about information processing. The organelle that is, oh, and I should say, I mean, I should define that term. I'm sorry. We call these internal packages in eukaryotic cells organelles,、um, sort of by analogy to the organs in an organism, the little pieces that. Function independently in eukaryotic cell, we'll call organelles. So the organelle that most、uh, is most associated with information processing in a eukaryotic cell is what we call the nucleus. In fact, it's the presence of a nucleus that gave rise to the name eukaryotic cells. The carrion,、um, which is from the Greek root for nut, was the name given by early microscopists when they were first describing cells to a large dark element that they always found in the center of this particular kind of cell. And that large dark element is this huge、uh, piece called the nucleus. So eukaryotic means essentially having a true nucleus, and the prokaryotes are cells that don't have a nucleus. When you look at a nucleus under a microscope, a high-resolution microscope, you actually see that it's divided from the rest of the cell not by one membrane, but by a double membrane system. We call that double membrane the nuclear envelope. So, what's ever in this nucleus is actually quite sequestered from the rest of the cell, but not quite, because if you look even more closely, you can see that within this double membrane system, there are a number of pores, actually quite a number of pores. So it seems as though there are channels. Where things can get in and out of the nucleus, and that'll become very important later when we talk about protein synthesis.
Now, the most important content of the nucleus, as you may guess, is the information that the cell contains. And that information is DNA. Actually, in cells, that DNA is physically packaged in long strings that are chromosomes. During most of the life of a cell, those chromosomes are just dispersed. You can't actually see them as individual strands. Uh, yes, the chromosomes are actually dispersed. You don't see the DNA as individual strands. It's only when the cell divides that this DNA starts condensing and bunching up and becomes what we would call chromosomes visually that we could see, you know, the, the little squiggly X and Y things that cell biologists might look at under a microscope. So that's what the nucleus does, is it acts as a package for, chromo uh, for DNA in the form of chromosomes. Now, we're going to come back to DNA starting in um, uh, just a couple of lectures in some detail, so I'll leave that for the moment. Now, there are two kinds of organelles that are specifically devoted to the problem of processing and storing energy. And these are called mitochondria on the one hand and chloroplasts on another. We're going to come back to mitochondria and chloroplasts in detail at the beginning of the third segment of the course when we start talking about energy more specifically. But for the moment, let me just give you a bit of an overview. Mitochondria are the site where the cell actually obtains energy by breaking down carbohydrates and other organic molecules, but especially sugars. Chloroplasts are the site where a process known as photosynthesis that we'll talk about later in the course um, actually captures energy, captures it from the sun, and uses that energy to build these organic molecules like sugars, which the cell will use to store energy over the long run. All eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. All eukaryotic cells need to be able to break down things to make energy that it can use for cellular processes. Only plants and a few other green single-celled organisms actually have chloroplasts. So that one special organelle that's devoted to capturing energy is only found in some subset of eukaryotic organisms. There's an interesting other thing about uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts is that they also have their own internal, uh, complex internal structure, um, and we'll look later at how that structure is necessary for them per to perform their uh, functions. They also have their own DNA. Mitochondria and chloroplasts actually need to replicate themselves so that when the cell divides, what happens is all of the genetic information that will be found in the nucleus gets replicated, copied, and separated into two daughter cells, but not all of the information necessary for building the mitochondria and chloroplasts. In fact, the mitochondria and chloroplasts themselves have to divide with some help from the cell, and then they just separate, sending some mitochondria over here, some mitochondria over there, as the daughter cells are created. The reason for that, interestingly, just as a little aside about the origin of life, is that it's thought, in fact, there's pretty good evidence that the place that these organelles came from was by some early cell engulfing another cell. Imagine one prokaryote engulfing the other, and then the cell that got engulfed becomes an organelle. And it's thought that independently, chloroplasts on the one hand and mitochondria on the other have arisen through that interesting evolutionary process. So the third and last major set of organelles found in eukaryotic cells is collectively known as an endomembrane system. This is very, very complicated, and I don't want to go through listing all the parts of the endomembrane system. Suffice it to say, the one piece of it that we want to name right now is called the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is just an extensive network of interconnecting branching compartments, all bound by a single connected membrane. The endoplasmic reticulum forms sort of an internal transport and processing um, system for the cell. This is the system in which different components associated with different parts of biochemical processes that cell the cell has to do are segregated. You can think of the endomembrane system as kind of a, um, uh, a processing and transport set of facilities that are analogous to the different rooms and vats and movable containers found in a chemical manufacturing plant. These different parts of the system all have to keep things separated and transport them at the right time to the right place. And that's what the endomembrane system does. Okay, so now we've seen how life is organized in a hierarchical fashion. And we've asked, and we've looked at a couple of these levels, organisms and cells, in a little more detail and asked why they're particularly important.
In the next lecture, we're going to return more directly to the theme of information in biology and begin to explore in detail DNA.